what I want to address is a question of deep significance to all of us. How do we drive high performance? How do we achieve the objectives that we set for ourselves as individuals and institutions? And I want to take aim right at the outset at the very seductive idea in the world today that to be world class in whatever activity, whether it's in crime prevention or my old sport of table tennis, which I used to play, was that mentioned in the intro, or uh, chess, it's, or whatever else, it's largely, or for some people, almost exclusively about hiring talented people. It's about having the right genetic makeup, the right predispositions. And on the other hand, if you lack the right genes or aptitudes, not you specifically, uh, if you haven't got the right kind of genetic inheritance, you're never going to make it. I want to argue not that talent is irrelevant, but that it's vastly overrated. And that because we tend to conceptualize our success through the prism of talent, it drives a whole range of measurable behaviors that undermine our capacity as institutions to reach the objectives we set for ourselves. And I want to unpack that idea over the course of this presentation. Um, let me give you one quick anecdote from my background in table tennis, if I may, just to sort of set the stage. Because it was very striking when I played on the international circuit how often people would watch me in action against an international level opponent and instantly say, you've got to the top because you have a gift. And if you've ever watched table tennis, you won't be surprised how they characterize this gift. It's one of the fastest sports in the world. The acoustics of table tennis are quite distinctive. Ching, 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 ching. Ball cross the net three or four times a second. So the gift people think that you've got as an international player is a gift of super fast reactions. It's that attribute that drew you to an activity where it's quite important, enabled you to progress pretty fast in the early weeks and months, and is ultimately a big part of the explanation for why you reach the top. And I have to confess that for a while I bought into this explanation because it is a very nice thing to think about oneself. I'm super talented. Uh, a journalist who came to watch me play in the US Open in the early 1990s wrote in a national newspaper, Matthew Side has reaction speeds at the outer limits of human capability. And I cut it out and kept it by my bedside table. And any time I was feeling slightly gloomy, I'd take a look. But I was disabused of this notion when I had a game of tennis, not table tennis, tennis against a chap called Michael Stieck. Now, some of you will remember some of the older ones. Well, not just the older ones. Uh, former Wimbledon champion, beat Boris Becker in the final. I was interviewing him for my newspaper, The Times. He was promoting a competition he was playing later that week at the Royal Albert Hall. <coughs> and my editor said it might be rather fun if instead of going along with a dictaphone and interviewing Steek in the conventional way, take a racket along. You're an ex-sportsman. Have a game. Have a chat across the net and get the information that way. These are the kinds of ideas that features editors have all the time. So I take my racket along, having a game, having a chat, in journalistic terms of success, but also getting slightly bored, because we're knocking it back and forth. When I wanted to feel the full force of his game. So I said, Michael, you may be unaware of this, but I'm also uh, an internationally acclaimed sportsman. Uh, he said at this point, Matthew, I've never heard of you, which was uh, slightly uh, irritating. And I said, look, if you go down the other end of the court and serve as fast as you can, I will be able to return the ball. Utterly convinced that with the gift that I'd been bestowed with by the Almighty, you know, the right genes, returning a serve in tennis is going to be pretty straightforward because the distance between two tennis players is roughly the distance between me and the wall at the end of this room, perhaps slightly further. The distance between two players in table tennis is just nine feet. So Steek starts warming up, and the atmosphere in the Harvard Club in Chelsea became ever so slightly tense. Uh, Jeff from the Sunday Telegraph said, Matthew, this might prove to be rather embarrassing. I said, Jeff, you've obviously never seen me play international level table tennis, or the concern wouldn't arise. Steek goes down the other end of the court, and I sort of crouched down, coiled like a spring. He bounced the ball, looked slightly archly across the net, threw it up, launched into his service action, and the ball came over the net, hit the court on my side, hit the wall behind me, and I hadn't moved a muscle. I didn't, didn't even twitch. I just heard this little clap of air as the ball went past my ear, as all the thud as it hit the curtain. I know it's like in your area, but it's characteristic of the arrogance for a lot of top sports people. I remember thinking, vividly thinking, hmm, I must have blinked at just the wrong moment. So I said, do it again. He said, four straight aces, came to the net, gave me a high five. He was giggling quite a lot and said, I slowed the last one down. So this is embarrassing, but also can I suggest, it's at least partially paradoxical. If speed in sport or speed in business decision making or speed in rapid fire chess is about the thing we conventionally think that it's about, that society insinuates that it's about, the innate gift that's been bestowed on the chosen few that preordains them for greatness but denied 
to the great unwashed who are never going to get anywhere. It raises the question, why as a top table tennis player can I react to a smash kill in the blink of an eye, but when returning a serve in tennis was seven times as long, I don't move a muscle. And it seems to me the answer to this question generalizes to all domains of human activity, and I'd love to go into it in some detail, but given the time constraints, let me say that it has nothing to do with innate reactions. If you test top tennis players on a neutral test of reactions, the red light goes on and you have to press a button as fast as possible, they're no faster on average than the average person in this room. It's nothing to do with superior eyesight either. What it's to do with, I suggest, is not weeks or months, but years of a particular kind of practice where top tennis players, through engagement with the phenomena in their domain of expertise, gradually and incrementally build up the capacity to make sense of it. In conceptual terms, it's like a doctor or a radiologist looking at an x-ray and seeing structure and meaning in a pattern that to an amateur who hasn't gone through all of those years of training cannot detect because it looks ambiguous and confused and noisy. That's not because they have better abstract reasoning that would be picked up on standard parts of an IQ test. There's no correlation. It's certainly not to do with better eyesight. It's to do with years of relatively high quality practice. The quality of the practice in healthcare is far too low um, and would be happy to talk about that more if you would like to. But I use that as an example because again and again, when one deconstructs the processes used by acknowledged experts, the significance of heritable differences is downgraded and the significance of the capacity to leverage the right data, to learn from mistakes, and to have the will and motivation to clock up meaningful practice becomes more significant. Why does this matter? Because how we conceptualize success radically shapes the behaviors we deploy in order to pursue it. In fact, you can give a questionnaire to any group of people, and this has been given to doctors, Premier League footballers, primary school children, NASA systems engineers, and many other cohorts to probe their subliminal beliefs and their conscious ones about how success happens. And broadly speaking, you get two kinds of answer. Over here, people say, well, to be really good at my job as a police officer or a minister or whatever, a table tennis player, you've got to have the gift. You know, don't delude yourself. You've got to have the, the talent for the job. This is a dominant view in Western culture. Over here, people say, well, talent isn't irrelevant. Of course, it's not irrelevant, but it's overrated. The dominant feature of high performance is our willingness to learn, to pursue marginal gains, to learn from our mistakes, to... Uh, people over here say things often like, you get out what you put in. Can I just emphasize, this is a subtle distinction. Over here, they're not saying hard work's irrelevant, but they think talent is dominant, <laughs> vice versa over there. The reason we know that is on the, this questionnaire, they're asked to rate the, the relative importance of these two things on a scale. <coughs> but the most important finding in organizational psychology of the last half century is that for all of the cohorts that have been studied, depending on how they answer, this one question predicts a wide array of very different behaviors. And I want to suggest to you, this doesn't just explain individual differences in success and the patterns that <coughs> exist out there. And it doesn't just explain institutional differences. It also explains some of the most important features uh, of human history. And over the course of my last bit with you, I'm going to try and unpack all of that. So let me just quickly talk through the behaviors <coughs> and see if they chime. Suppose I'm over here and I think talent's important. And moreover, let's say that I think I'm super talented. So success is about having a gift, and I am God's gift. There will be some parents in this room who know children who think in precisely that way about success. But in those circumstances, why am I going to bother to work hard? I'm a genius. I'm going to get to the top anyway. This, for those who are interested, is the classical psychological problem in Premier League football academies. I've spoken to almost all of them. Young people work hard to get into the academy, which is what you would expect globally competitive meritocracy that football is, but once they're there, in Arsenal or United, they take their foot off the gas. And the coaches blame a lack of hunger or motivation. That's not the explanation. This is a manifestation of a belief. The belief that to be a great footballer, you need lots of talent. And if you're in the Arsenal Academy, one of the greatest in the world, and you've got agents telling you how wonderful you are, and you're getting big bank transfers into your account for the first time, I must be a genius. And they don't put in the hard graft on the training pitch and don't make the transition into first-team football. What's worse in this mindset is hard work becomes a bit embarrassing. If I'm to work hard at this free kick technique, that means I lack talent, don't want anyone to know about it. 
People in this mindset worship effortless performance. Because if I can do something without even trying, that shows that I'm a complete genius. Think about what that means in cultural terms. This has a big impact on corporate institutions, which I'd love to unpack, but there isn't time. If the very process through which we make sense of the world and its complexity is something that we're slightly embarrassed about. Lots to say about that, but let me flip it quickly. And suppose that I'm in this mindset and I think talent's terribly important, but instead of thinking I'm super talented, I fear that I lack talent. This, I would suggest, very strong evidence to support this, is the biggest cultural problem in British state schools, where you hear young people saying, I don't have a brain for numbers. You know, not the kind of person who could learn a second language. One that I hear a lot, I don't have the hand-eye coordination for table tennis. Think about the behavioural manifestations of a belief in the importance of talent, juxtaposed with the inference that I lack talent because I'm slightly worse than some peer group at a particular point in time at mathematics, therefore I don't have the right kind of brain. It becomes futile to do the maths lessons or to want to do the maths homework. You can measurably establish the destruction of resilience captured by the way they're conceptualising success. And that's why we underperform on the PISA table. Massive problem in corporate institutes. Just very, no, actually, I probably haven't got time. Let me just contrast it over here. Because in the moment one moves from there to here, the way one thinks about one's job, one's collaborations, to a large extent, one's world is radically transformed. Failure over here is a bit of a disaster. Probably good evidence I lack talent. Maybe I should give up or cover up the mistake or try something else. Failure over here, or the weakness is by definition an opportunity to adapt and grow, because I believe in my capacity for growth. People respond to challenges in a fundamentally different way over here, which is terribly interesting in all sorts of different ways. And it almost goes without saying that people are more open about their mistakes and their weaknesses, because they see every single weakness as an opportunity to create a marginal gain. The cascade of behavioural differences associated with these two mindsets are wide-ranging, for those with an academic background, or academic or non-academic background, they're corroborated by randomised double-blind controlled experimentation. This is as cutting edge as the social sciences gets. But I want to get you into a position of seeing the institutional significance by asking you to compare two safety critical industries, aviation and healthcare. Aviation and healthcare, both safety critical. We want to get on a plane and get to the other end without dying. And if we have an operation, we want to get to the end of it without getting killed by the surgeon. So. Similar objectives, you know. <laughs> but they have very different cultures. Aviation, at an institutional level, this mindset, the growth mindset, the learning mindset emerges from a basic recognition and then a complex world which we can't fully understand. So our procedures, our methods, our models, our theories, our protocols are always suboptimal. Not because we're silly, but because of the complexity we confront. That orients the mind to look for the data for the technologies, for the learning opportunities that can drive a dynamic process of change. So we're systematically making better sense of that complexity and using whatever we can get our hands on to take us towards the objectives in a more efficient way. That's precisely what aviation does. So if there is a near miss event where two planes almost crash in midair, both pilots will voluntarily submit a report. There are thousands being submitted every month, probably 500 since I started speaking today. The totality of these are statistically analysed to figure out what are the systemic weaknesses that are leading to these near-miss events so they can make the reforms to avert accidents before they've even happened. And what if, God forbid, there is a big mistake, an accident, the biggest example of system failure? Do they cover it up? Are they worried about it? No, they make it data-rich. There are two indestructible black boxes that record the electronic information and how the pilot and co-pilot were interacting. So the investigation branch can go, analyse what went wrong and make the reforms so the same accident never happens again. Quick example, 1940s, B-17 bombers were crashing. The investigator found that the switch link to the landing gear and the switch link to the landing flaps were identical and side by side on the dashboard. Under the pressure of a difficult landing, pilots were pressing the wrong switch, the planes were belly flopping onto the runway, so he suggested adding a small wheel tab to one of the switches and a small flap shape to the other. They now had an intuitive meaning easily identified under pressure. What happened? Accidents of that kind disappeared overnight and it was a birth of ergonomics as a discipline. This process of institutionalised learning 
looking constantly for the data that can drive a rational process of change has had extraordinary effects on the hard data. Beginning of the last century, aviation was the riskiest form of transportation. In 1912, more than half of US Army pilots died in crashes in peacetime. Last year, the accident rate for the major airlines was one crash for every 8.3 million takeoffs. That is a staggering safety record, and it is not a consequence of a particularly talented cohort of people. They've probably got lower IQs than the surgeons. It's to do with a deep culture that when you're confronted by complexity, talent and intelligence is not enough. We've got to get hold of the relevant information, whatever that looks like, and the motivation to get it, it comes from this mindset. And let me contrast it with the doctors, where this is not true of all of them, and we're moving in the right direction. There's a big announcement last week by the Secretary of State for Health. He credited black box thinking with uh, inspiring him to do so. Sorry, that's slightly immodest. He's brilliant. So it was a very important announcement. So let me talk about how healthcare looked before the announcement last week. Where doctors who have long and expensive educations, and some of them have knighthoods, and letters after their name. So if they make a mistake, it's very challenging because they're supposed to be clinically infallible. The sociology of the doctor-patient relationship where patients have got their lives in the hands of this person creates what can only be described as a god complex. So when something goes wrong, instead of saying, right, we need to learn from that, this is a cutting-edge opportunity to make the changes to make sure the same mistake never happens again. The linguistic structure of how doctors talk to patients is of this kind. Well, it's just one of those things. Or there were complications or it was a unique case. In other words, they don't fess up. And so they subtly undermine the adaptive process. This is very well established, by the way, very long and detailed anthropological studies, as well as in the hard data that I'm going to come to. There's also a deep fear of litigation, being unfairly blamed. And you will know about this. As I've got a long chapter on baby P in the book. But being unfairly blamed for honest mistakes also has the effect of suppressing the adaptive information that can help us improve what we're doing. But the overall effect is that preventable medical error, let me emphasize the word preventable. These are the avoidable mistakes. In America, they estimate that 400,000 people die every year in hospitals alone because of avoidable mistakes. It's like two jumbo jets crashing every day. It's like 9-11 happening every four days. It's the third biggest killer in the country. Not because they're not bright, but because when you're in the wrong mindset, there's a negative correlation between intellect and outcome because the intellectual and creative energy is not going towards learning, but towards spinning and self-justification. That's a catastrophe in cultural terms. Quick example from, well, I mean, by the way, uh, a hospital of Virginia Mason in Seattle created a learning growth culture where when there's a medication error, they had a look at what was going wrong. They looked for the data. Would have been great if they'd had cameras, but it was the investigator, and I know that you're looking at all of that stuff, but they found that the two um, bottles were side by side with drugs with different pharmacological effects, but the same, virtually the same labeling. And you may say, well, why did the nurse get it wrong? But if you take too long to check it out, the patient dies anyway. So they changed the labels. That's a, let's call that a marginal gain, an incremental improvement. When they found that a patient came in with the wrong color wristband, which said, do not resuscitate, because the nurse was colorblind. They added text to the wristband. They found that in one half of the hospital, a clockwise turn of the dial of the anesthetic machine led to an increase in the drug, and in the other half, it was anti-clockwise. They never knew this before, because they'd never done the proper learning, because they'd been in the wrong culture. Another marginal gain by making it consistent. The totality of the effects was that this competent Washington hospital is now the safest in the world. Insurance liability premiums came down by 74%. And this is how our Olympians are doing so well. You know, Team Scott, we were rubbish at cycling in the last century. Never won anything, very much anyway. Never won the Tour de France. We now dominate the world. Why? Not because we've become more talented as a nation, but we've had a leader who's been looking for constant improvements. So breaking down the problem of winning a bike race into its component parts, improving every single one of them, by 1% to see an extraordinary cumulative effect. I'll quickly tell this story and then, I'll, then I'll, I'll shut up. So the aerodynamic design of the bike, they'd had the same bike for a long time, tweaked it, got a marginal gain, changed the diet, started transporting mattresses from stage to stage at the Tour de France, a marginal improvement in sleep quality. They all start using antibacterial hand gel. That's important because during the Tour de France, people are very susceptible to illness because they're knackered the whole time. 
That was another marginal gain. They are now, if that sounds obvious, think of the dynamic interrelationship between how much pasta you eat, cadence, speed of feet through the pedals, and how much power output you get as a consequence. If you tweak one of those for a given rider, what happens to the other two? Nobody knows the answer to that a priori. It took a leader with the desire to learn, to seek the relevant data in order to drive a dynamic process of change. And Team Sky have now won the Tour de France three times in the last four years. And our British Olympians are performing above their per capita uh, benchmark. So in, in summary, and you know, this is basically scientific method. It doesn't emerge from anything other than a set of highly specific psychological foundations. And when you go into the great organizations, you find people who are not trying to self-justify, who are trying to defend their existing reputations, but have an insatiable curiosity to learn more about the complexity they confront. Very few things more complex than crime. Crime prevention and crime detection. There are three long chapters on the weaknesses in the criminal justice system in black box thinking. I was at the Royal Courts of Justice this morning watching the Chad Evans appeal. Major, major problems with, with the criminal. And the reason isn't because the lawyers and the others aren't bright enough. It's because they're continually defending the status quo and suppressing the change that is rational and can improve the outcomes that they're looking for. Got a lot more to say. I hope that I sort of raced around there. Um, I'm so interested in what you're doing, by the way, um, in terms of using body videos. Yeah, love that. Pat finding patterns by using apps. Now, it seems to me these are absolutely the thing. And do you know what? There's a meta question of how one pursues the data in, a, in the most effective way, if that makes sense. And that all emerges from getting the mindset right. Get your institutions into the growth mindset. Find the tool. There's a very s clear set. Of, say 25% of the FTSE 100 companies are actively now in the business, HR function and at the C-suite level, of trying to integrate the growth mindset into the way everyone in that institution thinks about success. So everyone is constantly looking for those well-established marginal gains. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>